after which we'll have a very special surprise for everybody, uh, for the audience in, in the room. Some people are coming up from the working group, so I'm trying to give them a little bit of, of time. But I don't want to delay too much because everything is ready for the next. And our audiences are still following us. So I'm going to start. I hear voices. For our next session of the day, Sports and Development, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Ambassador Sherry Tross, Director of the Board of YABT, a diplomat and long-term leader on international development and cooperation. We welcome Jonathan Franklin, Los Angeles Rams Director of Social Justice and Football Development. Oscar Delgado, LA84 Foundation Vice President of Partnerships. And Eric Aldrich, LA28 Vice President of Impact. I leave you with your moderator. Thank you, Valerie. And Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this final panel of the afternoon. I'm Sherry Tross, and as Valerie has mentioned, I'm joined on stage by three eminent personalities representing important organizations here in the Los Angeles area that are doing amazing things, not just for the organizations, but for the community as well. We have LA84. We have LA28, and of, <laughs> and of course, we have the Super Bowl champions, the LA Rams. So this is meant to be a conversation among the three people on stage and those of you in the audience. And I hope that those of you online will perhaps submit any questions you may have that can be sent to the moderator and we can include those in the conversation. But we're gonna start off very simply, but very, very powerfully by asking each of our panelists to share with us just very briefly in a couple of minutes, their life story, how they got here. So let's start here with you, Jonathan. Great. Well. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to be, be here. Really excited to represent the Los Angeles Rams. And my career journey started here in Los Angeles, uh, playing football, actually. Uh, I was a sophomore in high school when I received an opportunity uh, through football to uh, attend UCLA. Uh, being a first gen, uh, it was a huge opportunity for me not to just continue my sports career, but really create a pathway for my family and my community, given no one has, one, attended college, but very few have, have attended college in my, the neighborhood I grew up as well. So I was really excited to really take the, take the next step, attend UCLA, uh, was blessed to have a great career, uh, breaking four records at UCLA, holding them all still today, uh, graduating in political science, and rather than putting together a resume, uh, I was able to train for the NFL from where I was drafted by the Green Bay Packers. And, and for me, growing up, I, I wanted to play in the NFL for years to come. But the first year, uh, the 12th game of the season, I was returning a kick, was hit, and I actually was paralyzed on the field, uh, suffered a spinal contusion, led to me retiring from the NFL. So life kind of flashed before my face, and this dream that I had from opening doors through, through college, through my dream to play in the NFL for years to come, it was what, what was next. So I began to kind of reflect on what was the, the next steps of my life and, and love sports, the transferable life skills that I was able to gain and relationships I was able to build. And uh, went back to work for the Green Bay Packers in an internship. From there, moved on to the University of Notre Dame. And in 2016, uh, left the Midwest and came to Southern California to join the Los Angeles Rams and just 
ended uh, my sixth season going into my seventh. And, and as I look back at the power of sports, you know, many times we can see the X's and the O's on a football field. For sports, for me, it, it provided an opportunity to attend college. It gave me the hope that I needed, not just for myself, but for my community, my family. And again, the transferable life skills. As I look back playing a game of football, there's so many skills that I gain that I, that, that I apply every day in, in, my prof in my professional life that I'm able to pour into um, others as well just through playing a game of football. So really excited that I was introduced to the game and now, you know, heading to my seventh, se seventh season, all from just playing football starting at the age of 10 years old. Well, that's a powerful story of triumph and then challenge and then finding a way to turn that challenge around into once again getting the success to where he is today. So that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that story with us, Jonathan. Now we're moving from a professional footballer to a professional diver. Uh, Oscar, let's hear from you. Thank you so much. An honor to be here, uh, actually sitting next to two, two old friends and a new friend. Um, but my name is Oscar Delgado. I'm with the L84 Foundation. Uh, it's tough to follow that story, but I, I believe that sports has also shaped my personal life and professional life, much like Jonathan. Uh, my uh, blueprint for success in, in life has been sport. I truly know the power of sports and what it can do for, for so many individuals. I'm a first generation American. My parents immigrated from South America and Central America. My, uh, personally speaking, my, my biggest success is arguably my biggest failure. And, and that was that I came up short twice on making the Olympic Games, but competed internationally, competed in two World Cups. Uh, in springboard and platform diving. Uh, I, you know, being a, a first generation American, sport shaped my life where it paid for my education. My parents didn't go to college. I went to the University of Wyoming, then went to Indiana University where I got my master's degree. Uh, in my professional life, I, I worked in baseball, just like Eric, uh, here with the Los Angeles Dodgers. So the LA is without question the, the, the city, the sports capital of the world with our professional sports teams. Um, but really, being at the L84 Foundation, our focus is, is really closing the gap that exists uh, with our communities and developing uh, processes and systems to make sure that there is equity when it comes to sport and play. Um, we're not fo focused on creating Olympic champions, but we're really focused on, on making kids life ready through what is sport. Um, so I, I live and breathe every day the, the power of sport. Okay, an excellent message. And I think we can all agree, most of us who at some point in time uh, who would have played some sport, not at the level of these wonderful gentlemen on stage, but certainly what you say in terms of giving life skills and making people life ready. Uh, I love that expression, by the way, life ready. Uh, that, that is a, certainly something very important that we can get from sports. Now we're moving from you, the diver, to a baseball player. So we've got football, we've got, you know, water sports, and we've got, uh, we've got baseball. So now we have Eric Aldridge, who's going to share with us his story. Absolutely. Thank you. So Eric Aldridge, Vice President of Impact for LA28. Briefly, LA28 is the private, nonprofit organization that will be managing the Olympic and Paralympic Games coming to our wonderful city of Los Angeles in 2028. I had the unique uh, ability to experience the games in 1984, which was fantastic, so coming back full circle. My life as a young baseball player, kid growing up in Inglewood, California, right down the street from SoFi Stadium, home of the world champion Los Angeles Rams, and one of the venues for the LA 28 Olympics and Paralympics, it was very typical. I was a sports kid down at the park, playing baseball, playing soccer, playing football, playing basketball. Normal kid stuff. Very fortunate to have the talent to be able to go on and play in college at UC San Diego and then have a professional career for two of my hometown teams. The Los Angeles Lakers, where I worked 10 years, received a championship ring. So you're not the only one that got a championship ring here, Jonathan, in 2000 thanks to the great Shaquille O'Neal and the late Kobe Bryant. 
And then on top of that, had a chance to work for the Los Angeles Dodgers, all around community relations and impact. So my story of meeting people and athletes and celebrities is all fantastic, but for me, the power of sport was a time when I ran a boys and girls club in Venice Beach. And there was a young man in 2007 that I met, his name was Jonathan McNeil. He was a 16 year old football player at Venice High School. He came into our club, he was shooting some hoops. And I heard about his story, some family traumas, trials and tribulations. His mom was sick, the brother that was in prison. And Jonathan was looking for support. He was looking for a mentor. And we talked about basketball. We played one-on-one, -on -one. he killed me. He was a fantastic football player at Venice High School. But our connection in talking about sport led to a relationship that lasts to this day. Jonathan McNeil went on and played linebacker at the University of Nevada. He's a personal trainer now, he's married, and is having a wonderful life. But the connection that we had around sport just always reminds me of that power that sport brings, even beyond all the things that I've been able to do around sport. So that is my testimony to the power of sport. Okay, thank you. And you noticed something. <laughs> even though we're all friends on stage, a little competition had to come in there. I've got a ring too, right? I saw that too. I, I was gonna comment, but I appreciate you. <laughs> Yours is newer and probably bigger though. So, By the way, I got a ring as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into this because you all have really impressive backgrounds in sports, but you've gone beyond and now you've translated that into other careers. How has that experience in sports helped you as you've developed your current career? Uh, maybe let's start down at the end this time. Yeah, absolutely. So very fortunate to have a career where I get to stay engaged with sport. And for me, it's really about taking what I've learned, the principles of hard work and discipline and teamwork and camaraderie and understanding when we're doing programs with young people at parks, at community centers, at schools, that those principles hold true for each and every participant of sport. Whether you're a star athlete, someone being introduced to the game, whether you are a third grade girl who wants to go out there and hoop with the boys, whether you're a disabled member of our community that wants to try an adaptive sport, sport is for everyone. And so what I learned is those components, those principles hold true when you're a kid and they carry you through life. And we try to integrate that in everything that we do out in the community with our programs. Fantastic. Oscar? Yep. Sport is a, is a human right. And I, I think sport is, is an equalizer as well. Uh, really, when you're talking about impact for community, you have the programmatic elements where it's direct service, but there also has to be an emphasis by large organizations to have to create systematic changes where there is, we are considering everyone because not everyone will be an Olympic champion. Not everyone will, will have a Super Bowl ring or a World Series ring. But for many individuals, uh, sports can save their lives. And, and really, it takes patience. Everyone loves sports, everyone loves winning, but at the same time, we can learn a lot from losing on, on the playing field. But it, it's important to have representation for men and for young ladies that are, that are playing sports. And, and also for other communities. Eric mentioned the Olympic Games, there's also the Paralympic Games. And so, uh, sport is an equalizer and, and it, it does take uh, people to understand the value that is sport and play to be able to implement those programs that impact so many. Thank you very much for that, Oscar. And let me just pick up on one thing. You said we can learn a lot by losing. And that is one of the messages that we very often give to our young entrepreneurs. Sometimes the first attempt fails. That doesn't mean you give up. You learn from the experience. So I think that's a very good message to give. Jonathan, let's hear from you. 
You know, I, I love the power of sports. You know, I really do in its impact. You know, what, what gets me excited on game days is, regardless if it's Monday, Thursday, Sunday, is walking in the stadium and, and looking around at, 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 the, at the fans and the diversity, right? From gender, from age, from socioeconomic, from um, whatever, you know, you can, the list goes on and on. In the midst of the, the diversity in the stadium, everyone is coming together for a common good. There's no barriers. Um, there's no tension, well, depending on, you know, what, what fan is next to you, right? Uh, but there's unity created through sports. And, and we're able to bring our communities together and, and, and uh, agree upon it and create conversation and friendships, right? What I, what I love once uh, walking into a stadium, uh, I, I saw a player with a Cam Akers jersey who's, who's one of our running backs. And, and uh, it was an adult, uh, a parent, a dad. He walked in with a, with a Eric Dickerson jersey and his son had on a Cam Akers jersey. So not only does it bring fans, to, fans together, but it also unites families as well. It creates opportunities to, for bonds to be created. So it's the beauty of sports and the power of really being a unifier within the stadium and outside. Okay. Uh, so let's now perhaps move a little bit away from you as individuals and talk a little bit about your organizations. And I know that all of your organizations are doing great work in the community here in Los Angeles. Uh, let's start with you, Oscar. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives that your organization is carrying out in the community, uh, how that is helping the community in its development goals, uh, and maybe how this helps to empower those communities? Thank you for that question. Uh, as Eric mentioned, so we are both part of the Olympic family, LA28, LA84 Foundation. For LA84, uh, LA84 is a, a private foundation. And so there was a surplus after the 1984 Olympic Games. Uh, there was several, a few hundred million dollars left over. 60% uh, went to the United States Olympic Committee. 40% went to start this foundation. And so the foundation manages the dollars that grow and then we uh, inject into the community. Now, as fast forward from 1984 to present time, we have started a charity arm, which is called the Play Equity Fund. And the Play Equity Fund is an umbrella that has many programs and initiatives, such as a partnership that we have with, with the Rams and other professional sports teams called the Alliance. Uh, in addition to that, we have a golf initiative, but there is more room for creativity and no geographic restrictions with the Play Equity Fund. And so it has its own website, its own board, separate from the L84 Foundation. But again, it's, it's really just trying to amplify the value and importance that, that sport and play uh, can impact a community. Because really, I truly believe that sport and play can solve a lot of the challenges we have in community. It, 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 the whole health and fitness industry, uh, wellness can be impacted if our kids are moving if all of the schools uh, across the world really put an emphasis on physical education. Uh, so it, it's, there are many programs where we have impacted well over three million children just in the Southern California region and hundreds of thousands of coaches. And Jonathan touched on this. When it comes to coaches, uh, you have the X's and O's of any sport, whether it's soccer or fencing or water polo, but then there's also that, that presence that a coach can play in a child. Um, so we have several initiatives. We, historically speaking, we have funded 51 different sports uh, across Southern California. So from equestrian to fencing to judo, cross country, but our emphasis on making sure that there's representation for those communities that are underserved. Well, I wanna just add to that because we have this great online community that's watching. And hopefully as we're listening to those of you on stage and hearing about the work that your organizations are doing within communities, that that will also inspire members of our audience to do perhaps similar things uh, in your own communities. Uh, might not necessarily be exactly replicable, but there are ideas here that can be drawn out. And that's what we hope will happen with this panel. Uh, so, uh, let's go to you, Eric, and hear what you've got to say on this. Yeah, so for LA28, I talked about my role as Vice President of Impact. And for us, 
there are four key areas, verticals that we are working under with our engagement. One is arts and culture, one is sustainability, one is economic empowerment. And the fourth one is youth sports. We've made a $160 million commitment along with the International Olympic Committee with the City of LA Department of Recreation and Parks to create access to sport and more sports and more training for the youth in Los Angeles. Now, we know that the biggest challenge that a parent has when they go to sign their kid up is the fee, the cost. It's a big barrier for a lot of families. And through this contribution, we're able to offer swim and these other sports at little to no cost to the participants. That's a game changer. That's a game changer in Los Angeles. And so for us, the way we look at utilizing our power as a convening force around sport to better the coaches, to create safe sport environments within these teams, within these sports that the kids are participating in, these are things that we have identified in the past we're missing and we're working with the community to make change. And I think it's an example of what we can do and what we're doing in the city of Los Angeles that we will be doing exponentially throughout the greater Los Angeles area as a part of the LA 28 movement. Excellent. Uh, the work that you're doing is absolutely incredible. And you know, I feel as if I have to come back just to do a study of what LA 28 is doing. So let's talk about the Rams, Jonathan. You know, I, I really look at it as providing hope where it doesn't exist and maintaining it where it does. You know, we, we definitely want to grow participation rates, but, but really is how can we create access and opportunity? How can we eliminate barriers and limitations based off the zip code where, where someone w w may live in? And one that's creating pipelines. Um, every year it's, it's providing opportunities for, for, for youth to, to intern with our organization and creating that exposure professionally, but also helping them see, helping individuals really have access to the inner workings of our organization. Uh, we launched a mentorship program where our staff members will, 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 men, will have high school students become mentees. And this is about a six, seven month program. When you think about uh, the education inequities, it, it's, we just launched a scholarship where we're, we're covering the, the financial education for 13 individuals heading to college this year. So how can we, we remove those barriers? But also it's how can we not turn a blind eye to community members as well? So we consistently work with various correctional facilities where we visit the facilities and host character education and, and, and clinics and, and really unifying the community. How can we uh, remove the barriers that we can sometimes see and, and those that we don't? So really, again, using the power of sports to create that access and opportunity for every community member within the LA region and beyond. Fantastic, so that takes us directly into another question that I wanted to ask, uh, because we talk about all the wonderful things that we do, but yes, uh, if you can perhaps mention some of the really successful, the most successful initiatives that you've had, but also speak a little bit to the things that have not worked because that's something that our entrepreneurs want to hear about. Talk about the things that have worked and also what haven't worked and what you learned from those experiences. Uh, Jonathan, let's start with you. <laughs> Right, so, so what ha has worked, you know, I, I know I men mentioned a few programs and, and, and another program that we re really pride ourselves at, again, it's about access, uh, is our Watch Rams football program. And really we use this as a bridge between uh, community and law enforcement. Uh, so we, we, we recruit youth within the housing projects of Watts. And uh, LAPD officers uh, are coaches for these youth. They are uh, what you create a football team. Uh, it's a tackle football league during the fall and it's a flag football league uh, during the spring. But also beyond that, these officers are able to, to check in on the youth, visit their schools. They're able to uh, become a mentor and really uh, play that role to give them hope, right? Really uh, envision success, not just as sports or entertainment, but really help them dream beyond the reality, right? But it all starts about through the power of sports. Uh, so this is a program we really uh, pride ourselves on because you have 90 to 100 youth that now has an opportunity to dream, that now is able to change their trajectory. One of few to graduate, not from college, but high school, 
right from middle school to have that hope to to inspire the community and I think when we impact individuals we slowly change it, uh, communities over time so that's something that we, we get really excited about and within the LA market uh, our approach has been listen learn and respond right and, and we'll continue to do that we, we, we necessarily wouldn't say there has been methods that has failed, but we're learning, right, to be the best partner within, within the market, working with LA 2028, LA 84, and seeing how can we provide the best uh, solutions to the issues that may arise, if it's homelessness, uh, education inequities, food insecurities, and beyond. We listen, learn, and find a way to respond and understand we're not the sub subject matter experts, right, but we do want to support and create the change through the power of sports. Listen, learn, and respond. Uh, I like that. That's a good message to give. And you were talking about uh, letting some of these young people that you work with, giving them the opportunity to dream. And that made me think of what our founder, the founder of YABT, was speaking about this morning. When this organization was founded, the motto was, do what you dream. And so giving people that idea that their dream can somehow be made reality with effort and with support of their communities and others, I think that's something that's very powerful. So, uh, Oscar, can you talk to us about some of the successes and failures and uh, what kinds of lessons you've learned from that and the institution has learned from that? You know, I think is, um, the, the panel that was up here earlier was uh, comprised of, of representatives from, from Latin America and I, and I heard one word and the word was legado, which means legacy. And I would say that really our entire institution is the proven model for any country in the world to understand that you have this giant event, but you wanna leave your fingerprint on the host. So whether you know at the 40,000 foot level, the World Cup, the Super Bowl, the World Series, that, that event is great. And, and everything that happened in 1984, from discipline ticket sales to merchandise sales to sponsorships, if you look at the Olympics before 1984, it was very different compared to 84. So I would say as a success, it's really just our existence because there was $232.5 million that was left over after 1984. And so the decision was, let's create this this entity that will be the gift that keeps on giving and impacting the community. Now the challenge is that we've been successful and now we have to be more successful, right? Because there are more children and sport and access to play has changed since 1984. So uh, I, I would say that if anything, you know, the summit of the Americas, what can you take away from this is you can host an event and it can be a, an event for kids and leave that fingerprint after that impacts the community. Um, as far as failures, um, I would say that collaborative work is very challenging. And so when you are doing collaborative work and bringing in various partners, whether it's local government, a professional sports team, a minor league sports team, various people from the community, I think it's a little, that's a little tricky. So it may not be a complete failure, but you have to, you have to pivot a lot and be willing to be flexible. Okay. So... Having heard about flexibility, which I know everybody in this audience has because we've had to be flexible all day. So flexible, flexibility everyone, we're good with that? Yeah? Okay, because we're not gonna keep you very much longer. We're gonna have a, like one more question and then it's gonna be open to you for Q&A. So start thinking about your questions. So let's go hear from you, Eric. Well, I'm, I'm gonna take it from both an LA 28 perspective and a bit of a career historical perspective. So from an LA 28 perspective, I think for me, I talked about our four tent poles, arts and culture, economic empowerment, um, sustainability and youth sports. But across that, we have three horizontals. One, our deep focus on athletes, but the other two, one is around disability inclusivity and the second is around racial and gender equity. And I think the two verticals around disability and what we can do and what we can do more for our disabled community, I can speak for myself. Um, what have I done in the past to really uplift and support that community more? I think we all need to better 
understand what those challenges of those athletes are and how we can help uplift them. This will be the first time that the Paralympic Games will be taking place in Los Angeles. We've had, this will be our third Olympic Games, but our first Paralympic Games. So I'm really looking forward to leaning in to that component. And then the racial and gender equity area. There are so many amazing sports to participate in beyond our American sports, football, baseball, and basketball. We got, you know, all these other sports that are Olympic sports that we don't necessarily give equal access to, whether it's cycling or water polo or swimming or some of the newer sports that are going to be a part of the Olympic Games, like surfing and skateboarding. How can we reach into those underserved communities to get those young people involved and engaged? So I think those are the past challenges, but those are where all the real robust opportunities lay in those areas. And speaking of other sports, there's one that everybody here wanted to hear, which is soccer. Yes. Well, that's, you know, that maybe goes without saying. That is a huge Olympic <laughs> sport. But we haven't gotten cricket in yet. And I know that's your sport, B. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> in the Caribbean. I'm good with football. <laughs> Me too. So, <laughs> Uh, so the last question, and, and this really is for you to speak directly to our audience, uh, both here as well as online. Uh, given the success that each one of you has had in your careers, uh, from the start until now, what kind of advice would you give to young, aspiring entrepreneurs coming up? Uh, based on what you've learned, the lessons you've learned, the experiences you've had, uh, your own analysis of where things are going. Uh, so this is your moment to be insightful and give some advice to our young entrepreneurs. So let's see, who wants to start? I'll start. Okay, Eric. I would say simply first and foremost, give yourself a round of applause, whether you're here in person or you're watching remotely, you've made a commitment to yourself to learn. So give yourselves a round of applause. And I know as a former athlete, I know as someone who coaches sports, and I know as someone who's worked in the front office of sport, there is nothing greater than the commitment. That's how you win championships. That's how you establish a successful career. That's where you move up within an organization is to make that commitment and utilizing the tools around you. And for me, it's always the people, right? Leaning into the conversations, making yourself available. Also, when you move up, also coaching and mentoring someone else, that, is, uh, that comes back to you twofold, I say, you know, in regards to you learning about people and processing. So again, that's my advice, and I hope you're all successful in the endeavors that you choose. I started Delgado. Uh, <laughs> words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. I, 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 I'm not as, as eloquent as, as Eric here, but I, I would say that we've, uh, I mean, Jonathan works in, in a front office of a professional sports team. We've worked in a front office. I, I would say that on the athletic field, in the offices, even if you wear a suit, uh, I have come to realize that winning cures all and losing reveals the truth. And, and that I think comes, you, you can apply that to everything. Winning cures all and losing reveals the truth. So we can learn from, from a loss. How do we get better? How do we move forward? Um, patience and collaboration, as I said before, we, we, we at our organization, we recognize that we can't do it alone, even though we have this, this endowment, this pot of money. So. Uh, again, I would just say that, you know, you got to be flexible uh, and you have to listen. And again, just you can learn from winning, but you can absolutely learn from losing as well. Good lesson. It's my turn, right? And it's your turn. <laughs> Go for it. No, that was great, Eric and Oscar. And, and for me, I, I think as I look back, it's all about perspective. You know, really being able to manage your perspective and what that manage your moments. You know, I, I recall a, a story that, that I was told 
uh, about years ago, years ago, uh, during the industrial age. Um, and there was an issue with elevators, right? Um, and elevators were um, slow, people were saying, right? And, and there, was, there was an article put out that elevators are too slow. And to invest in an elevator, an elevator was very expensive, right? For, for various companies that may have had them within their building. Uh, so a company sat down and, and really looked at this issue differently. They changed the fact of elevators are slow to people think elevators are slow. And what that did provided an opportunity for them to approach this problem and this issue differently. And based off the different approach, allowed them to provide a solution. And what they did was begin to put mirrors outside of elevators, right? To distract people from thinking that elevators are too slow. Right, and, and it's really the beauty of perspective, right? Our outlook and how we approach certain things in my job uh, really allows me to one, be a better thought partner, but really find ways to pr pr subscribe solutions to the issues that may arise within the LA region and beyond. So my encouragement is the perspective. It's all about your perspective and outlook. And once you control that, you can really manage your mo moments and really achieve the success that you want uh, upon the path that you're walking on. Uh, for the record, I'm going to steal the elevator perspective. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Next. That's Next a good panel. one. So we've heard from our three panelists, and they've been amazing. Don't you agree? And if you agree, an applause. So. so now we're at that fun part of the session where any of you get to ask a question. Are there any questions from the audience? Please go to the mic. Hello, everyone. I have a question. Which habits uh, you have been practicing during these, I mean, last years or during your life that keeps you or helps you to keep having this healthy life lifestyle with all the responsibilities that you now have, you know, with the leadership that you have with your organizations? And because I think that sometimes as much you grow with your organization, more tasks you need to, 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 to have, and sometimes the less you care about maybe the equilibrium. So I just wonder about, was wondering about these kind of habits maybe you can recommend us to us. That's a fantastic question about work-life balance and finding the healthy habits to keep going forward. Who wants to go with that one? I'm, I'm gonna jump into this one real, real quick. And it's easier said than done, but, but I think twofold. So I think we, we were all athletes here. And so I, I think the lessons we learned in sport, three key components, and again, easier said than done, is, is even in our careers, it's just like an athlete. We need to sleep well, we need to eat well, and we need to exercise. Um, so that's one fold. The second, I think, is just encouragement. My, you know, my, my family, my wife, my, my parents, encouraging and reminding, did you eat well today? Did you sleep well? Um, I think those are, those are really important because I think we get, we get excited, right, about our careers and the work and the projects and the programs that, that sometimes we don't pause to take care of ourselves. But I think it's, it mirrors how athletes perform so well. I think that's very applicable if you're uh, an ambassador, a leader, you're an example, and you're trying to, you're trying to, to lead and delegate, but it's, it's no different than what athletes do. We all. Do, does either one of you want to add to that? Jonathan, you look as if you're about to say something. I will. <laughs> no, I think that was great. Um, what, what has helped me is really being a learner and, and, and seeing how other people do it. Um, one, honestly, can be as simple as going on YouTube and, and just learning uh, how to manage habits. And, and there was a great book that I read uh, by the name of Essentialism by Greg McCown. And it's really about uh, how do you forget about the 97 things you need to do and focus on the three most important. And really, that's been my approach from a lifestyle, of, lifestyle balance is pr prioritization. You know, do I need to get this done today or can I get it done next week, right, next month? And, and, and really creating a to-do list, right? Really being able to visually see so I'm not overwhelmed and I understand how I can prior my day-to-day my, my -day responsibilities. So that's been able to help me in just reading a lot of books, listening, seeing who's perfecting 
the skills of habit and just really implementing in my life and really having individuals around to talk to, right, and not trying to do it by myself. I hope that answers your question and you have something there that you can take away. We have another question from the audience. Hi, my name is Isabella and I would like to know what advice can you give specifically to women who would like to pursue a career in sports? Eric. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, my colleague Abel is here and I was, I tasked him with if no one asked a question about women and gender and sports that he had to ask a question. So you asked the question and I'm happy to answer it. So a couple things. One, I've had the good fortune to mentor uh, a lot of really talented women in sport. Uh, there was one organization that I worked for. I uh, had a young woman who was out of college, worked her way through the ranks. And at one point in time, she was told, well, you can't go any higher because you can't get in the locker room to work with the athletes. And I remember having a conversation with my boss and I said, why? She's great at her job. She's great at all the technical skills of her job. The locker room is a locker room, right? And so I think people have to be allies and champions. So you have to find people that, um, operate for you in that way, but specifically around your technical skills, you have to do what everyone else does, which means you have to get in there and find what you're passionate about within sport, um, be great at it, study up on it. So if it's marketing, digital marketing, communications, community relations, whatever that part of sport is, you have to really lean into it heavily because here in Los Angeles, sports and entertainment are really, really big. And there's a lot of competition. And sometimes I'm not even sure how I was able to work at the organizations other than I had some good fortune, but I was really passionate. And I knew a lot about what I was talking about. And so that would be the challenge to you and anyone, any woman that's in the room that wants to work in sport. Know your craft get really strong technically. Thank you, Eric. Uh, either of you want to address this? I think really quickly, I, I would just say, uh, this is both for men and for women, is, is finding a mentor. Uh, finding a male mentor, so you understand how males operate in whatever industry it may be, and also finding a female mentor that's uh, in a leadership position. I think perspective, right? Um, but it, 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 in the sports world, it can be challenging. We need more women. We need more female coaches. We need, we need more women to play sport and to operate in sports. Yeah, I agree. I think one, just know it's possible, right? Not allow your gender to, to mentally get you to believe that it's a barrier. You, you can do it, right? I think it starts there. And two, I know this past year, we, we've been really pushing gender equity and, and looking to sanction girls flag football in the entire state of California. So I've been able to have a more in-person, you know, connection, right, with the girls within high schools and, and creating that hope. Um, and I think it's all about networking, right? It's who you know, what you know, but also who knows you, right, in the world of sports. So I think really taking advantage of moments such as these and, and events uh, throughout the market that you're in and building those relationships, following up and maintaining, maintaining relationships and doors open, right? It's all about relationships in the world of sports. I want to add one more thing, one more thing, because it's on my notes on my phone and they're specifically around gender and sport. A couple things, 91,000 attendees at the FC Barcelona women's game this past year, right? Phenomenal numbers. Right now, college softball is blowing it out the water on ESPN. The whole concept around you know, women sports not, you know, being equitable men's sports, women's sports not making as much money. Well, these networks aren't putting these sports on at prime time. These stadiums aren't filling up like Angel City sold out 22,000 their first night here in Los Angeles at Bank of California Stadium. That's not happening because women's sports is bad and not watchable. It's happening because women are phenomenal athletes. A lot of these teams have women executives behind it. So sometimes don't listen to the narrative. 
the possibility, as Jonathan said, is definitely there. Women coaches in the NFL, and, and by the way, baseball, et cetera. No, don't get me started on women. Celebrate the small victories. It's the 50th anniversary of Title IX in the United States. That's, and, and there's still more work that needs to be done. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, in our, in our backyard, for the sports fans out there that are men, you talk about this, you, you need to buy a ticket. Buy a Sparks ticket, buy a, an Angel City soccer ticket, and support, so support those, those, uh, those teams. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Jonathan, please, go. No, it's okay. We believe in you, I guess. We believe in you. You got this. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, Isabella, clearly your question sparked uh, quite a response here on stage. And behind all that, because I heard that before I came on stage, is well, how come there isn't one female panelist? Well, at the next session, we'll probably have some. But the, the point is here, I think, what each of you is pointing out and what Isabella is also pointing out, is that in the business of sports, there's room for everyone. Men, women, everyone. You know, we all go through these discussions and we say, well, you know, there are these many people at the table and, and sometimes there are always arguments about why people shouldn't be included and why this group should not be included and that other group shouldn't be included. Well, we have to get past that and I think we are getting past that and you are seeing that happen and it takes people like you, Isabella, and people like the, the men on this stage, men and women working together to make the change that needs to happen. And that is already happening, but that needs to happen at an even more rapid pace. So thank you for that question. We have another question from the audience. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Lucas Gomez, and I can relate to all of your backgrounds because I'm also a professional athlete, and I, I'm getting emotional now. Six years ago, I was in a deathbed, and I didn't know if I was going to survive. Um, and the crazy to think about, one of the things that stuck in my mind was, am I going to be able to skimboard again? Because that's the sport I love. That's what I love doing. And it brought me back to the feeling of doing something you thought was impossible in the past. Because I think that's the feeling of sports that eventually um, I survived. I, couldn't, I could barely walk for over six months. It was the worst period of my life, but that's what made me start my company and be here today watching you guys speak. My question is, what was the toughest moment of each of your lives and how has it affected who you are today? What have you learned from it from a business or entrepreneurial perspective? I think Jonathan should answer this question because when, when I met Jonathan, it was, I was inspired like I am hearing you inspired by his personal story. Okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. You said your name was Lucas? Yeah, so great meeting you. Um, different situations, but I, I think the hardest moment of my life and it's interesting as I look back at that was the biggest blessing but what was when my career ended you know I, I started playing football at 10 years old and 22 I had to medically retire due to an injury and <laughs> I love how life works right and um, for me football was a dream it was a hope it, it was my identity it was my purpose and when the game was gone it wasn't just football, it was my identity, it was my choices, everything that I did aligned back to sports. You know, I would work out to be the starting running back. I would work out to get ready for the team. So my, my approach on life just kind of shook upside down where even the confidence that I got was from everybody else but the man I saw in the mirror. And I don't know if you can con connect, but I see you shaking your head. It was a depressing moment for me where I didn't know who Jonathan was. And I think I was at a place of my life just completely lost and, and hopeless, and, and I had to figure it out. And as I began to build the blocks of who I was, uh, uh, as I look back now, I can see the skills that I gained through playing the sport, the, the ambition that I developed, right? Being on the field, wanting to win a championship, the hard work, the discipline that I was created, uh, it, it was it's the same thing in life, to help rebuild who I was. 
And I think that's in the same way has been my approach in life and my, my professional career. And now as I look back, being at peace now, having joy, but there's so many transferable life skills that I gain, right? And, and the beauty of the doors that open, you know, through football, which I love this sport. And now I think as we grow the game for, for young men and young women, um, allow them to see that they are enough, right? And not found their, they find their value in sports, but create their value through sports, you know? And I think that's what we're able to do. And, and that's what gets me excited every day because we're able to transform communities and transform the f future through it. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful answer. And that I think is what we're gonna get from the stage. You're not gonna get anything better than that, quite frankly. And, and may I say congratulations to you, Lucas, on bouncing back from such a terrible accident. Uh, that really is a tribute to, to your own strength and the strength of those around you to have brought you to this, to this stage. And, you know, listening to all three, I mean, Jonathan, your story is amazing. Uh, but so is the story of Oscar Delgado, so is the story of Eric, so is the story of so many of you that I've had the opportunity to meet over the last couple of days as we've gone around. Uh, yesterday we had the chance, by the way, of visiting SoFi Stadium. That was fantastic. And I think they all want to be invited back. Uh, yes, but that was a great experience and we're really very appreciative of the support that we've received from uh, the LA Rams. Uh, so let me just wrap this up, unless there are any other questions, let me just wrap this up by thanking each of our panelists because I, I think, you know, these are busy guys. Uh, they have a lot that's going on and, and they took the time to come and meet with us today and share their experiences as individuals share something about their organizations and the work that they're doing in the community and really to connect with each of you and maybe find just one little spark, something that connects in terms of their experience and their background that might connect with you sitting here in this hall or you watching online. And if just one or two people take away something that changes your life, and that makes a difference. And you can look back one year, five years, 10 years from now to this moment when you heard these three gentlemen on stage speak to sports and development and the power of sports in helping to shape people's lives. The flexibility that you need, the perspective that you need to develop, the mentorships that you need to cultivate, the ability to listen, learn, and respond. I like that, I'm gonna steal it. I'll attribute it to you, I'll, I'll give you that. These are all very important things. And sometimes we hear them and they just seem to be words, but when we inculcate them and recognize the power behind the words and how they can become part of what we do and how we connect with what we do, then that's transformative. So please join me again in thanking our panelists for being with us today and for be doing such a great job. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.